Welcome back. At this point in the narrative of the Bible, the Persian Empire is in control, and uh, King Cyrus had allowed all the people to return to their homelands after being exiled, and he even funded the rebuilding of the cities. Uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, those two books, give us a glimpse of what life was like in Jerusalem, trying to rebuild Jerusalem and get the Temple of God rebuilt, get the walls up around the city for protection. And then we switch over to the book of Esther. And Esther gives us a glimpse of what was happening outside Jerusalem at the time. Uh, there's no mention of God at all in the book of Esther, which is very interesting to a lot of people. And um, the book was set during the time of King Xerxes. Ahasuerus is the Hebrew name for King Xerxes, and he's the one mentioned here. Uh, so I'll just insert Xerxes instead. But in the, uh, during the days of King Xerxes, um, he, King Xerxes sat on his royal throne, which was at the citadel of Susa, and we get the date. This was around the year 483-482 BC. Uh, so it's the third year of his reign. He gave a banquet for all his princes and attendants. And we've seen before, we've seen leaders do this, where you know that you're starting to struggle, your power is declining a little bit, there are more threats popping up, and it wouldn't be too long before the Greek Empire would take over. Uh, and here we already we see King Xerxes just being very aware that things aren't going to be as easy as they had been before. And he's trying to gather support. He's showing off his strength, his wealth, his military power. And he has this six-month period where he has all this wealth displayed, um, really just trying to show off and show people how strong he is. And at the end of it, he throws a huge seven-day party where all the important people from really like the whole kingdom, uh, they were there so that he could gain their support. And during this huge party, uh, you know, people are partying. The men were in one section, their wives, uh, another woman, were in another section, both having a huge celebration, huge party. Uh, everybody's, um, they could drink whatever they wanted, eat whatever they wanted. If you want water, you got it, all the water you could need. If you want wine, martinis, beer, whatever it is, you got it, it's there. And a lot of the people were choosing the wine. So we have Xerxes' wife, Queen Vashti, leading the banquet for the woman in a separate part of the palace where King Xerxes himself was leading this. So on the seventh day, the, toward the end of this whole week-long party, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded a bunch of his servants to bring Queen Vashti before the king. Uh, with her royal crown in order to display her beauty. So, you think about it this way. There's a bunch of guys all together uh, getting drunk and talking about whatever. They guys tend to brag about lots of things, including women. And uh, it sounds like they started just, they all started bragging about, uh, you know, my wife is so gorgeous and I've been with this woman and that woman. And, um, Xerxes kind of listens to this for a while and he sits back and he says, oh, people, you don't know what you're missing. You've never really seen Queen Vashti. She is the most drop-dead gorgeous woman in the world. And, you know, probably slurring his speech a little bit as he goes. And uh, the other guys are saying, oh, yeah, yeah, whatever. You're Xerxes. You, you know, you, you have to say that. But no, she can't be as beautiful as this one. They're all just carrying on like this. And um, finally... Xerxes says, you know what, I'm going to prove it to you. Hey, guys, uh, come here, go tell Queen Vashti to come to me. Uh, tell her appear, to appear before the king with her royal crown. Period. Just the royal crown, nothing else. Specifically, the, the Bible says, tell her to come before the king with her royal crown in order to display her beauty. And uh, he expected her to come before these drunk men wearing nothing but her crown. And therefore, Queen Vashti refused to come. Now, no matter who you are, you do not refuse the Persian, uh, Persian king's order. And Xerxes was an extremely powerful king. Uh, even though he was you know, really trying to maintain that power here, 
but he was still very powerful. And the queen, even if you're queen, you don't have permission to approach the king uninvited. If the king calls you, you go. If the king does not call you, you don't show up. And if you do show up, you risk your life. You, you can be put to death just for going as queen to see the king. And if the king commands you to come, you go. Uh, the only reason for Queen Vashti to refuse this, and really she's risking her life doing it, uh, the only reason is because of what she was asked to be doing here. It's not that he wants her to come fully clothed, wearing a nice gown, and show her off. She would have done it. He said, no, come wearing your royal crown, and that's it, nothing else. And she refused, and the king became very angry. His wrath burned within him. And when uh, the leader of an empire like this, uh, when his wrath burns within him, it's bad. So the king started talking to his wise men and the officials, saying, what are we going to do? What do we do with Queen Vashti? And the other people join in, saying, hey, she hasn't just wronged you, she's wronged all of us, all of the men, because she's there leading the woman's banquet. And the woman just saw Queen Vashti say no to the king. And if she gets away with that, you know, Queen Xerxes, if you let her get away with that, then all our wives are going to start saying no to us. We can't let this happen. So they decide that King Xerxes will issue an edict where Queen Vashti, basically he throws her out, divorces her, and she's never allowed to see him again. Time goes by, he misses her. And, she, you know, I guess she really was that beautiful, and uh, he enjoyed her and just misses her. So his men, his servants, come and say, hey, King Xerxes, we have an idea. We're going to have a beauty contest through the entire kingdom and we'll gather young women from all over your kingdom and we'll find the most beautiful young women and one by one you can take a turn with them uh, get to know them a little bit and whichever one you choose whichever one pleases you the most will become queen in place of Vashti the king said hey that's a great idea so they came up with this program a year-long program after they selected all these women uh, they would have a year of training and beauty contact or beauty treatments. So they'd be they'd learn how to um, hold themselves, how to walk. They'd learn what the king likes and doesn't like, and they um, just were prepared for um, doing their best job in impressing the king. And I'll say more about that in a moment here. Well, at this point in the book of Esther, we're introduced to this guy Mordecai. And Mordecai was he would serve uh, in the uh, in the city. Um, he had some connections, not directly with the king, but with the leadership. And he'd be going through the city doing work. And he was raising a girl called Hadassah, who is also known as Esther. And that's uh, obviously who the book is named after. Well, Esther was gorgeous, and so she was chosen as one of these contestants, these people who will have a chance to become queen. And uh, one of the, the eunuchs, uh, the people who would care for the woman uh, in the king's harem, um, he knew Esther was like the king's type and said, this one, she's going to go far. So really took a lot of attention with her, helping her. Well, here's how the Bible describes how this woman would become queen. Each young woman who was, you know, part of this beauty contest, each young woman who uh, became one of these contestants, uh, she would go into the king. And the Bible describes it this way in the book of Esther. The young lady would go into the king in this way. Anything that she desired was given her to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. Well, what things would she desire to take with her? Um, it's not really talking about like her purse and her favorite blanket. Um, so listen to how, how it's worded here. In the evening, she would go in, and in the morning, she would return to a different harem. So you have all the virgins, 
one by one, they would go in the evening to be with the king, and they'd leave in the morning and go to a new harem for the people who were no longer virgins. So it, what is their job? How do they become queen? Well, they please the king uh, in bed. And uh, what would they take with her? You know, what, what would she take with her? Pretty much whatever the, uh, the leaders of the harem said, the king likes this. Take this with you. And here's how you use it. So this is not, this book is not rated PG. Um, so she would, this woman, once she was, uh, she had her turn, her tryout, I guess, um, King uh, got to know them very well that night. Uh, then she would not go into the king again unless the king delighted in her and she was summoned by name. So unless the king calls you by name, you, you don't go back. So Esther's turn came she did not request anything to bring with her except what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the woman, advised. He did everything that this guy said the king likes. And she found favor in the eyes of all who saw her. She was taken to the king in his royal palace, and the king loved Esther more than all the other women. She found favor and kindness with him more than all the virgins. So he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. So apparently she had a really good night with the, or at least the king did. Uh, so she became the queen. Mordecai, her uncle who was raising her, her parents died during the Babylonian era and her uncle was raising her. Um, well, when uh, the, Mordecai uh, told Esther, don't tell anybody your heritage, don't let anybody know that you're a Jew. Well, then we get this flash back to Mordecai. So Mordecai was going about his business, and this other guy called Haman, he, he was coming through. Haman was um, walking around. He was second in command, um, at least in that region, under the king. Very important official. And he demanded that everybody bow down before him. Now, bowing down literally is what the word worship means. So everybody would worship this guy, Haman. And Mordecai, as a Jew, said bowing down in worship to anybody is forbidden in Scripture. It's forbidden by the Torah, so I'm only going to bow down to the Lord, not to this man, Haman. Well, Haman found out about this, and he was furious with Mordecai. And, you know, it's publicly... Uh, shaming Haman, basically, and refusing to do what he said. But he found out that Mordecai was refusing to, work, to bow down to him because he was a Jew. And so Haman decided, I'm not just going to kill Mordecai, I'm going to kill all of the Jews, because that, you know, if what I'm hearing is correct, then no Jew will bow down to me. I can't have this. So he had the king sign an edict and he said, King, we have this one group of people who are extremely troublesome, and we have to get rid of them. Uh, here's why. And he explained the whole situation. They're, they're rebellious. They're not going to bow down to anybody, and there's no respect there. We've got to get rid of them all. The, the king said, okay, you do, do whatever you want. So he comes up with this plan, and he gets the king to sign an official edict, which cannot be changed, even by the king himself, to say that anybody in the entire kingdom, in all of Persia, uh, on such and such a day, you can kill any of your Jewish neighbors and take all their possessions as plunder. So all of the Jews are going to be killed. Um, Haman, in chapter 3 of Esther, is called an Agagite, meaning a descendant of Agag. Well, who is that? Well, you've got to go way back to King Saul's day. Saul fought a battle, and he was supposed to kill everybody on the enemy, any, every one of his enemies, and he left a bunch of people alive, including King Agag. And Agag himself ended up being killed. The prophet Samuel killed him, but some of his descendants apparently still lived. Uh, and because Saul didn't do the job, here, one of his descendants, Haman, is about to kill all of the Jews in the world. So Esther learns about the plot, and Mordecai said, Esther, you need to do something. And Esther explains 
Mordecai, I would be happy to do something, but the king hasn't called on me in a month. It's been a full month, and I haven't heard from him. I can't just walk right into the king's presence. I'll be killed for that. And she would. That's the rule. That's the law. So if the king doesn't summon you, and you appear before the king unsummoned, you'll be killed. Uh, so if the king sees you approach him and says it's okay, then you're okay. You, you, but it's if the king doesn't say that, you know, you go to the king on the wrong day and he's in a bad mood. That's that's it for you. So Mordecai says, Esther, listen, don't think that just because you are in the king's palace as the queen that you're going to escape this any more than any of the Jews. Sooner or later, somebody's going to find out you're a Jew and you'll be put to death too. And besides, maybe God allowed you to, uh, to be there just for this occasion, just so that you can save the Jews by your position. So Esther does approach the king. And the king, I mean, obviously he knows the laws about this. So when Esther appears in the doorway and the king looks up and sees her, he knows something is up. You don't just approach the king. She could be put to death. He knows that she knows that she'll be put to death. So it's got to be really important. And he, he gives the okay, right? Um, please let her in. So she approaches at, so thankfully that she's not being put to death here. And the king says, Esther, what is it? You know, ask anything you need. I'll, I'll make sure you have it. I'll give it to you up to half my kingdom, right, just like the, the kings would say, um, meaning anything you need, tell me and it's yours. And Esther said, well, my king, um, I came because I have a request. Um, and she's kind of stumbling over her words, she doesn't know how to say it, and she finally says, here's what I really want from you, O king, please come to dinner. <laughs> and the king kind of says, well, okay. And he knows she didn't just risk her life to ask him to dinner. But he agrees. He says, okay, I'll go to dinner with you. And she says, and please bring, bring Haman as well. And Haman is thrilled about this, right? The queen wants me at dinner with them. Wow, this is like, I'm really, uh, my career's coming together for me. And the king shows up at dinner and everything's good. They have a great time, uh, nice dinner. And after dinner ends, the king says, now, my queen, Queen Esther, I know that you didn't come into the palace just to invite me to dinner. Please tell me what's troubling you, and I'll give you anything you ask for. And she says, well, my king, here's what I really want. Please come to dinner again tomorrow. <laughs> and the king kind of says, well, okay. And he goes, and uh, the next day, uh, some horrible things happened for Mordecai and, uh, or, I'm sorry, not Mordecai, for, for Haman. And, um, but they end up showing up at Esther's house again. And so finally the king, after dinner, the second time says, now, Esther, I know there's something going on here. Some, and you seem nervous. You've, uh, invited me to dinner twice. Please tell me what it is that you need. And she says, okay, my king, I would not bother you with this if it wasn't vital, but somebody is trying to kill me and my people. And if they only wanted to make us slaves, I would not bother you with this at all, but they really want to kill all of us. So please spare us. And the king obviously flips out. Somebody is trying to kill my queen and all of her people, all of her family, all of her um, bloodline. Who is doing this? And she turns to Haman and points. He issued this decree. I am a Jew, and he issued the decree to kill me and all of the Jews together. And the king looks at Haman. Haman had no idea she was a Jew. He realizes what's at stake for him now, and uh, it's not good. Well, the king is utterly furious. He storms out, slams the door behind him. He goes, I, I gotta think about this. I gotta get some air. Slams the door behind him. Well, when you eat in the Middle East, you eat reclined, right? You kind of sit around a table. There are very low couches. Like Think of like a couch, but with no legs. It's just on the floor and you recline on it. And so Esther would have been reclining at the table. 
Haman and the king would all have been reclining at this table. Well, the king storms out. Haman sat up, like, in a panic. When the king left, he started pleading with Esther, please, spare my life. I'll do anything, anything at all. And the, Esther didn't know what to say. Haman, just in this terrified frenzy, came over and, like, grabbed her and was shaking her, saying, please, spare my life. Please, help me. Don't do this to me, please. Well, the king walks in seeing his queen reclining and Haman hovering over her, shaking her. <laughs> and that's, that's it for Haman. Immediately orders that he be sent away. And shortly after that, uh, Haman had prepared uh, a place for Mordecai to be killed on it. Uh, it says, the text says hung, but not hung like by a noose. It's, you're, you have this huge, like a, uh, think, huge tree or telephone pole with a point at the end and you're dropped onto it. That's how you're hung. And that would be, uh, that's what was planned for Mordecai. Well, the king said, no, that's not for Mordecai. <laughs> put, put Haman on it. Well, they still have this problem that the king, because of the Persian view of the king, if you're a divine king and you make an official decree, that decree is perfect and can't be changed. So he's issued this decree that all the Jews will be killed by any of their neighbors and their stuff taken as plunder. What do you do? You can't change that decree. And they brainstorm, they try to come up with something and just nothing's coming. Finally, they come up with sort of this desperate plan. Uh, the only thing they can come up with to save the Jews is by now the Jews would know who's after them. Um, you know, the day is coming and um, one of the Jewish men will pull into his driveway and get out of his car and his neighbor will say, oh, that's a really nice BMW you got there. It's going to be mine in four more days. I'm, I'm going to come after you. Right? And the Jews know exactly who their enemies are by now. And they issue another decree saying the Jews, before this day happens, the Jews are allowed to go out and kill their enemies preemptively. Uh, you uh, kill them first so that they can't kill you. And uh, that's pretty much all they could come up with to stop this thing. Um, but the Jews celebrate the saving of all of the Jews in a feast called Parim. And uh, there's a little explanation at the end of the book of Esther about that. Well, we have one book left in the Hebrew Bible that we haven't talked about yet. It's the book of Malachi. Uh, Malachi is one of the minor prophets. And in the Christian Protestant Bibles, it's the last book before the Gospels. And this is set probably somewhere around the end of the book of Nehemiah, somewhere around 433 B.C., and God is rebuking the people. They, it wasn't too long ago that they returned to their land. God allowed them to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the city, and they're already becoming corrupt. So God is rebuking the priests for some of the things they're doing wrong. He actually says uh, it, when the priests offer a sacrifice, they would um, sort of gut the animal a certain way before the offering and then throw the, the guts away. At some point, God says, I'm going to spread those guts, the, this refuse, on your faces, uh, the refuse of your feast, and you'll be taken away with it. Um, so, I mean, these are pretty harsh words for the people. Um, God says that you, as a people, you've robbed me, and, um, you know, you're, you're not giving your tithes, you're not... Um, you're not tithing properly. When you offer sacrifices, you're offering the, the lame sacrifices, your animals who are, you know, the three-legged goat or the, the lamb that's blind. And so God says, try giving that to the governor to pay your taxes and see how it goes. Um, the book of Malachi ends, though, with a, another prophetic vision of the Messiah. And hopefully you remember the Messiah, the word means the anointed one. And it's the anointed king from David's line who will come and reign as king. And here's what Malachi says. The day is coming, burning like a furnace. All of the arrogant and every evildoer will be chaff. On the day that is coming, the day that is coming will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness, and that's a title for Messiah, for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. 
and you'll go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. And we'll revisit this passage uh, in a future session. Uh, and the book ends this way, Behold, I am going to send Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, so that I will not come and smite their land with a curse. And that's the end of the book of Malachi and, uh, and the end of the Hebrew Bible as well. So in the next session, we'll talk about the time between the Old and New Testaments, and then we'll talk about the Gospels and um, introduce the coming of Jesus as a child.